everyone, Captain Leon here, and if your jet pump sounds like a bucket of bolts, well, you're going to love this DIY do-it-yourself video, because for just about $100, one Benjamin, we're going to get that thing purring like a kitten. We ought to call it Benny and the Jets. Okay, people, listen up. Listen up. No, not to me. I'm just a Yama peeping Yuga tuba. Listen to your boat. You have to hear how it sounds, and if something is off, you need to identify it. We spend so much time just admiring the beauty of our vessels when, in fact, it could be talking to you and telling you it is in need of repair. And that's exactly how this story begins. I started to hear something in the jet pump that sounded a little rough around the edges. The theory was that the impeller housing might be a little bit swollen and that the impeller might have been hitting. So I wanted to just test that. We, we shot a little CRC 656 in there. Uh, you know, you could use WD-40, but if it quiets down, you know that you have a little rub spot, uh, which is very, very common in these boats. So let's take a couple of minutes now and let me show you how I rectified the problem. And may I add, very inexpensively. All right, so we're gonna begin the process by taking a look at what needs to be removed. So obviously we have the linkage here for the steering. Uh, that's gonna have to come apart. And you can see we have the thrust vectors installed. Uh, also on my boat, I have the lateral thruster. So all of these add-ons are somewhat uh, in the way for what we need to do, but we're just figuring it out here. The jet pump is basically just held on by four bolts, right? So there's two on the top and two underneath, and I'm gonna do the best I can to take apart as little as possible. So we're gonna start off by removing the linkage for the steering. Okay, uh, it's a bolt and a nut. It's pretty simple stuff. And we're just going to go ahead and, and get that off. Uh, just pay particular attention. There are these little vinyl washers that fit in uh, around the bolt here. And what that's going to do is ensure that you have a pretty smooth steering. When you do reassemble this unit, please make sure you get those vinyl washers back in. I mean, look, you wouldn't want to lose steering, would you? That could cause a problem. Yeah. All right, so our next step is to disconnect our directional control cable. That's the cable that pushes our bucket up and down to give us the forward neutral and reverse thrust. I've seen many people disconnect all the bolts around this cable. There's absolutely no need. This cable just has a spring-loaded collar that all you have to do is slide back. Once you do that, the cable will pop right off the ball. It's a ball and socket assembly. Uh, I demonstrate this in one of my other videos on how to obtain absolute neutral. And once we get that cable disconnected and the bolts loosened on either side of the bucket with the thrust vectors, that whole assembly will come off, leaving us just the nozzle that rotates back and forth. Uh, and now we can get out the four main bolts that hold the jet pump in place. The top two ones are easy enough, they're not terribly tight. Uh, the bottom two ones would also be easy if I wasn't a lazy ass and decided to just leave the lateral thruster in place. But I was able to get at them with a box wrench, loosen them enough, just keep backing them off, and then we were at the point that the whole assembly was loose. Just need to apply a little pressure to the sections by inserting a screwdriver in the tabs that are intentionally uh, molded on the side of these units to be able to apply pressure to separate the sections. Once I remove that nozzle, you can see the two bottom bolts are still in place uh, where they were with the lateral thruster uh, holding them in. And now we are at the point where I'm able to see the cone unit and the inner part of the jet pump. And believe me, 
I was anxious to get in there with a light and take a look around and see if the culprit was visible. And sure enough, there she blows. My rub spot was evident uh, right there on the lower quadrant of the impeller housing. So now we're going to go ahead and again apply a screwdriver to the back in the tabs, apply a little bit of pressure, uh, working it back and forth and eventually that impeller housing unit will loosen. Uh, you can see here that I'm just moving it back and forth a little bit and now we're going to slide it out. And when you slide it out what you want to do is just pull it straight out and what you can see right there I lowered it down. Do not do that. I realized after because the back end of the shaft where the spline is is now up in the air and it's applying pressure to the hose, the boot covering if you will, uh, inside the bilge area. There's no point in doing that. Keep that shaft straight as you're pulling it straight out. Okay, and that's the way to do it. Okay, now we're left with just the impeller housing, and uh, we'll get a little closer in, and whoa, feel the burn, baby, feel the burn. Yep, there she is, and as we take a look at the impeller, we can see that it's got a little bit of rubbing on it, uh, not terrible, it looks like we caught this soon enough, but you can definitely see where one of the blades was a little worn down as it was scraping against that swell spot on the impeller housing. All right, and now we're going to go ahead uh, removing that impeller housing. It's basically four bolts, right? So there's two on the top, two on the bottom. There's a little one, a little smaller than the others to the left. So it's really five bolts in total. We'll go ahead and we will pull out that smaller bolt. I'll just show you here how corroded these things can get. You do need to take some time to clean that up before you pull it, or I should say put it all back together. Uh, and now just with just a little jiggle and a wiggle, you should be able to get that impeller housing off. That's the part we need to replace. But once we've done that, we can get a real good glimpse right here. And this is like uh, the dark side of the moon, right? You don't get to see this that often. Uh, but this is where the shaft goes in. You are looking directly into the bilge area there. And this is the back side of the intermediate bearing, right? So that's the bearing at the back of your engine. This is the back side of it. Uh, this is a seal in there that keeps water from in infiltrating your boat, uh, which is obviously very important. Uh, and while we're at it, let me just mention that I've personally witnessed some water seeping in uh, around these screws and around this unit here. Um, so it's a good idea while you have it accessible to just seal it up a little bit with some 3M5200 and you should be fine. Uh, and lastly, just inspecting, you can see the water jacket where water enters the engine to cool it uh, coming from the intake on the jet pump. Okay, welcome to the workbench. And as you can see where my finger is pointing, we have a little uh, glitch we have to overcome. This metal sleeve uh, that my finger is pointing to uh, is basically like a guide sleeve. And there's two of them, one on either side of the impeller housing. One just pulled right out, but this other one was frozen in there good. And the only way for me to get it out, because you do need to reuse it on the new unit, uh, is to hacksaw it, right? So the impeller housing is made of aluminum. It was very easy cutting through it. You can see I put two notches in it and then just tapped it and then that chunk of the impeller housing came right off exposing that metal sleeve I was able to then just tap it right out it was just frozen in there I cleaned it up a little bit and we were able to reuse it on the new impeller housing Want to hear the most annoying sound in the world? Okay, people, there you have it. What a horrible noise it is. Now, the question is, why is it doing it, okay? Well, first, let's start with the clearance and how tight these tolerances are. According to the shop manual, it's only 0.35 to 0.45 millimeters is the impeller to housing clearance. Just to give you an idea, that is the thickness of four sheets of paper. So what happens over time 
is the metals that make up this impella housing separate a little bit from one another. You see it's an aluminum housing with a stainless steel insert pressed into it. Now here you can see the stainless steel. It's that thin little ring pressed to the inside. And because they are dissimilar metals, they're gonna react differently to temperatures and tolerances over years. Well, apparently a little moisture got in there and caused the stainless steel to just swell up. And that's all it takes, just enough for the impella to start hitting. So what's the solution, right? How do we get around this? Well, if we look on an aftermarket level, there is the Solus, right? So this is a replacement impella housing made of 100% stainless steel. This won't happen. You won't have a swell factor. But what I didn't like about it is, well, first of all, it was twice the price. And second of all, if you take a look at where the bolts mount to it, it's these external nuts that drop into these slots. And I could just see that the more you tighten it, you're starting to pull that flange in. I wasn't crazy about it. I opted to go with the OEM Yamaha replacement part. First of all, I like the way that the bolts go in. It's a tapped hole and it's all encased, protecting it. It worked well for the last six, seven years, so why not? All right, let's get these parts cleaned up as best as we can. And let me take a moment to say, please subscribe to my channel if you appreciate this content. If it's helpful to you, please support me. Hit the like button and hit the notification bell to be alerted of new videos. All right, let's get this put all back together. But first, a moment from our sponsor. The most amazing kitchen appliance is here. It chops, it dices, it slices. Cucumbers, fruits, vegetables, lettuce, ice, you name it, it does it. And with the controllable nozzle, you can shoot your chopped products in any direction you like. It's the Jetsta by Ronco. And we're back with a quick lesson now on the water flow and the cooling system of our boats. Inside your jet pump on the left hand side, that white rectangular unit is an inlet strainer. And the water rushing through the jet pump not only propels the boat, but some of it goes into that strainer, flows up behind this plate with these four bolts, and exits out this hole toward the engine for purposes of cooling. This scene from my video exposing my underparts where we cover everything in the bilge area, you could see I am pointing to the actual hose with which the water flows through to head into the engine for cooling. Now most importantly is periodically you want to remove these four bolts and this plate on the side of the jet pump to inspect your strainer. If there is anything in there that's impeding the flow of water, you're likely to have an engine that is going to run hotter than it needs to be or should. And you should also expect, inspect, I should say, all the other ports uh, associated with the flow of water all the way up to the point where it enters into the boat. Interestingly, when you're running the engine on the garden hose, if you're flushing it after a day of fun and sea, right, you can see by looking inside that the water is flowing out that strainer. It's actually moving in reverse from its normal flow uh, as the fresh water is flowing through everything. All right, let's continue on with the assembly of this unit. All right, so just doing a dry fit here of the new impella housing over the impella so that we can take some measurements on the tolerances. It's very important that you stay within the range of, you know, as indicated by Yamaha within the service manual you know, that 0.35 to 0.45 range. If there's too much of a gap between the impeller blades and the impeller housing, you could end up with some cavitation. You want to get maximum thrust. And as you can see, I mean, we're there. I mean, any closer this thing's going to be hitting. So uh, I think we're in good shape. Okay, Yama peeps, just bear with me here a moment. I figure it is a good time to inspect our bearings while everything's apart. You cannot really get to the inner bearing unless you remove the impeller, which I'm not doing. So uh, I can check the outer bearing, might as well. We're gonna loosen these three bolts here uh, and pry off the cone. And I'm just very carefully doing that. I wanna see if I have any water that's gonna come on out. Uh, and sure enough, I have a couple of drops 
I really was getting concerned about that. You don't want water intrusion, but as I go ahead and remove the entirety of the cone, it really was a non-issue. Just, just a little bit of moisture was in there. And here we can see a brownish, yellowish old grease uh, within the cone. The bearing itself wasn't really too well lubricated. Uh, but keep in mind, this is a, a seven year old boat. This is the first time this has been opened. There's about 250 hours of exclusive salt water use. And uh, I wanted to just spin the shaft, get an idea of the feel. And you know what? She was as smooth as butter. I mean, there really was not uh, anything I could feel that uh, seemed, uh, you know, uh, in need of repair. Uh, everything visually looked good as well. So now I wanted to just repack these bearings and hey look, I've been on the forums, I've seen people talk about using oil to, you know, fill this area up and not grease. I know there's different techniques. I know everybody has an opinion and you know what they say about opinions, right? Um, but not everybody has a service manual. So, you know, for me, I like to resort to the Yamaha engineers uh, and what they have to say and uh, just stick with it uh, works best for me. So that being said, as we go through the manual, we can take a peek and see that the grease that is to be used uh, within the cone itself is listed as an EP grease, yet uh, we see that the grease to be used on the bearing uh, is a grease letter A. So uh, we have two different greases going on here. And you know, when we go to take a, a deeper look as to what these greases are, uh, we see that the EP grease is an EPNOC uh, number zero grease. Uh, and the grease A is very simply just a Yamalube uh, marine water resistant type of grease. So, you know, what is an EPNOC grease? Uh, you know, we did a little research on that. Uh, we read into it specifically, you know, an EPNOC zero. Uh, and I can tell you after all of my research, I don't have a clue. <laughs> Well, call me crazy. Here's Johnny. But I decided to leave the Epnoc Zero that was in there. The manual calls for only what amounts to about seven, eight pumps out of a grease gun. Not much in the inside of the cone. As far as the actual bearing itself, I just stuck with my Lubramatic uh, trailer wheel bearing grease that I also use on the intermediate bearing. I know, someone's going to tell me I screwed up here, but look, I'll give it a whirl. What can go wrong? Alrighty, and one last step before we head to assembly, and that is to grease the spline end of the drive shaft. Referring to the manual, we see that it's grease letter M. Uh, yeah, M. Okay, so we're talking about a poly poly moly bedendum disulfide grease. Uh, yeah, no. Uh, I'm just sticking with my regular bearing grease on this one. Wish me luck. Okay, Googans, time for our final assembly. And as we can see, the manual calls for the application of sealant to the mating services of the impeller housing and the jet pump unit. They are calling for a 518 sealant. When we look further into the manual, it just indicates it's by Loctite. I did have a tough time locating that, but lo and behold, the Permatex uh, company, uh, Permatex is now uh, sold to Loctite. They're almost one in the same. Uh, there is even a cross-reference chart available online. And when we take a look at that, we can see that the uh, Gasket Maker 518 is the same as the 51813 Permatex anaerobic gasket maker uh, that was easily found at a local uh, auto parts store uh, it even indicates on it that it is ideal for aluminum and we went ahead and applied that to all the mating surfaces uh, careful not to have it ooze into any of the ports or holes uh, and then began the process of assembly uh, you know we indicate that the uh, you know, torque setting for the bolts, according to the manual, is 29.5. Um, also used uh, a little bit of Loctite, the removable uh, kind, on our bolts just to ensure they don't come loose. And we uh, busted out our spare no expense Harbor Freight 
uh, torque wrench, right? And we set that puppy to 30 pounds, uh, close enough, right? And then we began the installation process. Quick last tip here, if you're having a hard time getting the spline to line up, just reach in through the clean out port and turn that shaft a little bit and give it a pull and that ought to do it for you. Okay, everyone, that's pretty much bringing our video to a conclusion. Captain Leon here saying thank you for watching, and I hope you have found this video both informative and entertaining.